Don't forget to smile, folks. You all have beautiful smiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You are smiling, so we will smile. <laughs> you keep reminding us. <laughs> Everybody looks so grim and serious. We're on Facebook Live. Uh, we are good to go. Um, so, Sir Faf, the floor is all yours. All right. Jazakallah khair. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace to everyone who is watching us and to everyone who may be watching us later on. My name is Afaf Nasher. I am the executive director for the New York chapter of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. And we're really pleased to be joining you this morning. Um, you know, CARE does care about our community, obviously. And one of the things that we want to do is to make sure our community stays informed on a whole host and range of subject matters that we believe are important. And uh, Brother Ahmed, my colleague and our litigation director at CARE New York did a, a, a uh, post two days ago with regards to travel restrictions. And today we wanted to meet up with some Muslim physicians who are really on the front line, who are dealing with the coronavirus uh, and helping our community and way beyond. And we wanted to make sure that we get the perspective and information directly from those people who are on the ground. And you know, just starting this conversation off, which should be pointed out that the ISPU estimates 50,000 physicians are practicing in the United States alone. And in the New York City, approximately 9% of all physicians are Muslim and 12% are pharmacists. And that really is you know, a, a wonderful asset, not just obviously to the Muslim community, but to the entire community as our physicians, again, are on the front line of treating people with, with COVID-19 as well as other illnesses. And let me um, introduce our panelists today, three prominent physicians that I'm really blessed to know. We have Dr. Farhana Sati, who is an infectious disease specialist at Mount Sinai. Dr. Ijaz Ahmed, who is a practicing internalist and cardiologist at NYU. And Dr. Salim Shazad, who practices pulmonary and critical care specialties at New York Presbyterian. Welcome to all three of you and Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so the format of this <clears throat> is, you know, we have Brother Ahmed, my colleague, who's also going to be monitoring any questions that come up, and we can do that at the end. But what I'd like to do really is to get right into the discussions. I know you're all super busy these days. And again, the point of view is really from you, the physicians. We want to know what it is that you're seeing and the pertinent information we need to share with our community. So um, Dr. Salim, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Uh, could you please quickly remind us of the harms that uh, people who are coming into your office are suffering from? What are really the symptoms that everybody should be looking out for? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, with this COVID-19, uh, which is a viral infection, um, I would categorize it into the symptoms, which would be mild, moderate, and severe. So most of the people, about 80-81% of the patients are presenting with very mild or no symptoms. So the symptoms which are more common are myalgias, which is a muscle ache or pain. Um, they have upper respiratory tract infection, which means they have a uh, stuffiness of the nose. They have some post-nasal drape, they feel a scratchy uh, throat or a feeling of itchiness in the throat, and they feel a low-grade fever. So those are with very mild symptoms. And the, some patients, which is about 15% of these patients, they do uh, uh, present with pneumonia symptoms, which is when they breathe in, they have a difficulty in breathing, or they have a shortness of breath or they have a fever which is getting high grade, or they have cough which is uh, also productive, which means they produce mucus with that. Or um, some patients, uh, which is about 5% of the patients who do require intensive care units, and those patients who may require a ventilator or so, they are very sick patients with that. But majority of the patient, I would say, who present to the office or in outpatient settings have very mild symptoms. Let me just um, follow up with that, please, because you presented some symptoms that are pretty normal and things that so many people face, especially right now during allergy season. I know when you said stuffy nose, I mean, an itchy throat, 
those are symptoms that we regularly see with allergy season or with other things. So when people experience these symptoms, should they immediately panic? Should they immediately be thinking that they have the virus? So that's a very good question, you know. So three things which can mimic and can confuse and they can look alike are, as you said, the allergy season, absolutely. I have a big asthma practice and I do see patients with an asthma the symptoms look alike. The second thing is the flu season, we still not over, you know, the flu season is still here. So we have cases of influenza also there. And right now we are in a pandemic, which is in a COVID-19 uh, uh, viral infection that is also present. So these three uh, disease processes, the symptoms look pretty much alike. But again, with this, um, most of the people who do have it, you know, we have to go by uh, the contact. You know, if somebody has a close family relative or living in the household, you know, who's working in the hospital settings, or they do have the symptoms, or, you know, while they have been tested positive for that. So those are the people who will put them as a first, uh, you know, close contact with the patient. So those will, this, that will be a big clue that you may have COVID-19 infection. But again, back to your question uh, that 80, 81% of these patients have a very mild or no symptoms. So if someone has a very mild symptoms, they don't have to get panic. They need to make sure uh, they stay home. If they have the cough or fever, they should wear a mask at home. They should stay away from the family members and self-quarantine yourself. Dr. Ijaz Ahmed, please join us. Um, I know that you wanted to add to those remarks and please tell us in addition to what you wanted to add, maybe just tell us a little bit about your practice and what you're seeing in your office as people walk in. Dr. Ijaz. Thank you, Afaf. Um, as Dr. Shazad Salim said that the symptoms are very confusing, but we have to see right. in the perspective. So what I am seeing, a lot of patients are coming in or calling if they have a flu-like symptoms, then we have to screen them that which category they are in. For example, the patients who became positive, I will tell you that story or perspective. So one patient who called me that he's having symptoms, but he had like nine hours in three, day, three days, over three days, nine hours, he's, he's stayed in subway. And he's feeling a uh, headache, low-grade fever, like 99.5 and uh, nothing else, a little bit of headache and low grade fever. And he's not getting better. Whenever he tries to get out of the bed, he's like extremely tired, no symptoms. So that patient, we sent for the testing and he was a positive, he was positive. Okay. Another patient who, who had history of 67 year old who had asthma history, and now he was having extremely bad breathing, uh, difficulty in um, breathing, respiratory distress. So um, usually he, he's very stable. We know that over two years, all of a sudden, but he also had exposure. He was in subway. So when somebody has exposure, some kind of exposure. So um, keep in mind that the spreading of the virus is mostly person to person. If, if somebody is in a crowded place where somebody can cough or sneeze on you, so that is number one risk factor. If you are touching things or um, knobs, you can wash your hands. So the chances of spread is very little with that. But if, if you are in a crowded place where there is a chance that somebody has coughed on you and you were unprotected, you didn't have masks, and then you develop symptoms in three to five days after that. So that is a case we should definitely test for that. Okay, let me get Dr. Farhana Sati in this. Dr. Farhana, again, welcome to you as well. Please, you know, you are a physician at Mount Sinai, you're an infectious specialist. Maybe you can please elaborate for us and remind us about why it is important for us to contain the disease, how we go about it. And, you know, Dr. Ajaz touched upon how it spreads. If you can please add to that with your advice and what you're seeing within your environment. Thanks, Afaf. Yeah, I would definitely like to <clears throat> make it very clear to everyone that this disease is spreading very fast. And it is rapidly, we, I mean, my practice is mostly hospital-based and we are seeing a big influx of patients. And the scary part is that 
it's, we are seeing a lot of young to middle aged patients getting very sick, staying in the hospital <clears throat> because this virus is causing really bad pneumonias, like Dr. Shahzad mentioned. And I think the only way we can contain it is by uh, social distancing. And I think people have to understand this, that this really is serious and they need to take it seriously. <clears throat> the most important thing to prevent this is hand washing. Like we already discussed that it spreads mostly through droplet uh, and contact. <clears throat> Droplets through people who are talking, especially if they have the virus, but they don't have the symptoms, they are at a lower risk of spreading, but still it can spread but more with people who are sick and who are coughing. And these droplets can stay on surfaces for hours and sometimes days. Different studies have shown that it can stay up to like 72 hours to up to nine days. So we have to be very aggressive in controlling this infection <clears throat> by containing it. And the only way we're gonna do it is by social distancing. We need to stay six feet away whenever we are outside from each other if somebody is sick at home, you have to isolate them, put them in a separate room. If you can give them a separate bathroom, that's better. Otherwise, disinfection is very important using Clorox or any approved bleach or wipes uh, that are approved for disinfection and they have or a 60% alcohol <clears throat> products. They should be you know, wiping the doorknobs, uh, the switches, um, and obviously hand washing is the most important thing. Hand washing, like uh, I'm sure everybody is hearing it. You have to wash your hands for 20 seconds yes. uh, with soap and water. You don't need an antibacterial soap. A regular soap works perfectly fine as long as you're washing your hands properly. <clears throat> okay. Yes. So containment, isolation of those showing symptoms, washing your hands for 20 seconds and trying to stay away from public places. And, you know, we were touching a bit about the subways and how easily this is spread. Dr. Ijaz, can you sort of put into perspective just how quickly this is spreading and, you know, what numbers look like? So, apart from what uh, the studies have shown from China and Italy, that if one person is infected, that person gives to 2.6 more people. So, so you can imagine from uh, one person to so 2.6 people, then those 2.6 people, they give to each 2.6. So then those 2.6, so multiply it multiple times. So in five days, one person spreads to 3,500 people in five days. So that's why this is very important that to contain that person, one person who has it, to contain that person socially isolated. Otherwise, one person infection means 3,500 people will be in the community affected. And uh, of, of those 3,500, then each of them is giving to another, another 3,500. So in next 15 to 20 days, that's how it is calculated by epidemiologists that millions of people can get affected. So one, when one person is infected, the only way to contain it, that person does not give to somebody else. So isolate it, that's what we are doing very aggressively. Otherwise, there is no way to stop the spread. Well, those numbers really sound scary. Dr. Shazad, let me ask you, I mean, you are dealing with people with respiratory illnesses all the time, and we've been hearing that those with underlying conditions are especially at risk, those that are elderly. And I would think that many of you see uh, those patients in your practices. But Dr. Shazad, um, especially because this is a respiratory illness, it attacks the respiratory system. Could you tell us again who those vulnerable populations are and, and also touch upon whether kids seem to be, you know, either bounce quickly or are even maybe immune as one of my children had said. Let's, let's clear up that misconception and talk about who is most vulnerable and are children immune to this illness? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, first thing is, you know, talking about patients who are uh, more vulnerable. So if we look at the studies of um, the China elderly patients, you know, above age 65, somebody with a chronic kidney disease, somebody with a hypertension, somebody with a diabetes, you know, those people were at vulnerable. Looking at the pulmonary uh, diseases, somebody has an asthma, which Dr. Ijaz touched upon on that, you know, 
their asthma, which is usually not getting an exacerbation or not acting up, but now it is acting up in this season. There could be a clue, you know, underlying, you know, that's, and somebody has another underlying lung diseases, which is a lung fibrosis and others, you know, they having said that, that means their lung are already compromised. If they get in any other illness top of that, they may be more vulnerable and they may get a severe disease uh, from this um, uh, viral infection. Um, so that those are the patients, you know, and those are the patients which we be in very close in touch with them, making sure either through the phone calls or, you know, they're coming into emergency when they really need to come in. Not majority of patients do need to come in, but if they need to come in, we have to find a timeline or, you know, in talking with the patients or the patient monitor their symptoms to coming in emergency and getting uh, care. Um, and talking about children, um, you know, that's, it's, we look at the China studies, you know, uh, it was a very minute fraction of uh, young patients, less age, less than 20, who got uh, infection. A majority of those who got infection, uh, they recovered from it quickly. And the mortality rate was pretty low and it was almost dismal. Uh, so, so having said that, you know, we don't know the underlying process, what exactly has caused it. But the good news is in majority of kids, uh, they somehow this is not being um, prevalent that much and it is not being uh, causing much issues. Thank you for that. Um, so what should a community member do if they think that they actually may have this, may have some symptoms? I mean, you know, it, you sort of touched upon um, that not everyone has to come into the office. So what should we do if I have a stuffy nose, if I have a sore throat, I'm thinking, well, it's probably just allergies. Should I go double check with my physician? Um, I think if you have the symptoms, which is, as you said, looking like your regular allergy symptoms, the patient is the one who knows about his symptoms the best. If the symptoms looks exactly alike, those are from the allergies, they don't need to panic. They just have to do what they normally do and take maybe, or, you know, antihistamine or any other medication, what they regularly take or taking any other medication, which helps them. If they're developing fever, which is not getting better. If they're developing a cough, which is persistent, not that cough, you know, like one or two times, which happens, uh, uh, you know, with their allergies or so, that should not make them worry. Um, are they have any developing any shortness of breath? Are they developing pain while they're breathing in? Those are the symptoms which should make them worry. And the first thing what you should do is be in touch with their primary care physicians uh, through phone calls and speak to them about the symptoms and discuss. And um, if the physician, uh, you know, seems it feasible or you know, would like them to come in, they may have them walk in, uh, arrange, you know, uh, testing as an outside center. And if the physician thinks, you know, that these patients may have symptoms which are more worrisome and they may get worse, they should, um, you know, triage them to emergency rooms where, you know, we can take care of those patients pretty efficiently. Thank you so much, Jazak uh, Dr. Ijaz Ahmed, let's get you on, you know, again, one of the primary reasons we're doing this is to really get the perspective of the physicians. And I wanted to know um, what, what has changed with your practice? I know I called you yesterday and it was pretty late in the night and you were still driving home. It seems like that you've been bombarded. If you can give us the perspective from what you're seeing in your office and, and how busy it's been since, from what I'm understanding, if you have mild symptoms, you should just call your physician. So what's really changed in your office day to day? So as uh, Dr. Salim um, said earlier, a lot of people who have mild symptoms, flu symptoms, or allergy mm -hmm. symptoms, they are very worried, especially if they have exposure. So everybody is calling doctors, especially myself, and many other doctors, whoever their healthcare providers are, that what should we do? So that's why we are very busy to answer the questions and telling everybody what to do. So the, the uh, summary, what we have been telling is that Keep in mind, if you go to hospital, there are a lot of people who are infected. The chances of you getting infection in the hospital or emergency room is more than at home. So that keep in mind. So going to hospital is not a cure. First of all, you should know that there is no treatment in the hospital. 
So only people who are going to get help from the hospital if they have a respiratory distress, we are gonna put them on a ventilator or in ICU. Other than that, there is not a real treatment. So if you have mild symptoms, if you have cough or a little bit of fever, stay home and take Tylenol. We did say that don't take ibuprofen. So this is, I have been telling my patients and I've been monitoring them every day. The people who are positive, first we screen everybody that who should come to office or you should stay home. Coming to office is not going to be helpful also. So most important thing is you stay home and monitor yourself and talk to your doctor every day how you are progressive in your symptoms. If your symptoms are getting worse, most importantly, respiratory distress. If you are having shortness of breath, then go to emergency room. Otherwise, just stay home. If you have a suspicion that you want to get tested, there is a number the Department of Health has offered 28 labs that you can go to the lab, your doctor can send the prescription, or you can just even uh, call one number, 1-800 number, which I provided you earlier. So you can just call and get yourself tested. There are 28 labs in New York and all over the country, there are Department of Health. Each Department of Health, for example, Alabama has own Department of Health, Texas has own Department of Health, each Department of Health has multiple labs listed on their websites and they will give you free testing. So most of the people are getting free tests if you wanna get it checked. But if you are positive, then the best way to treat is stay home and take, keep on taking Tylenol. Because if you go to ER, if you go to a hospital, there is, keep in mind, there's no real treatment. Unless somebody is having respiratory distress, then they may need a ventilator. Also keep in mind, we have 97,000 ICU beds in all over America. So if, if a million people get infected, there are not ICU or beds or ventilators. Right. Too. So only go to hospital if you really think that your breathing is becoming out of control. It's very hard. Otherwise, just stay home. Well, Dr. Farhana Sati, I mean, you work in a hospital and um, I... I I'm hearing what Dr. Ijaz Ahmed is saying with regards to, hey, there, there are not enough hospital beds to treat everybody that comes in with mild symptoms that perhaps it's best to stay at home. But you know, as a social justice activist, I'm worried about access of care. You know, Not everyone has a private physician or even healthcare, and sometimes people rely on hospitals. Would you please tell us what you're seeing in the hospitals and whether you think that there is equal access to medical care for those that might not have a primary care specialist. Yeah, Fab, <clears throat> there is definitely, definitely equal access to everyone. I think the priority in the, when the patient comes to emergency room is what, the, what their condition is. If they are sick enough to be hospitalized, we are hospitalizing everybody. And right now, the criteria, I'm sure Dr. Salim, who also does critical care, knows that the criteria for <clears throat> putting them in critical care setting is based on their oxygen saturation, how they are breathing, how their overall condition and what kind of uh, underlying illnesses they have. So these are the criteria everybody has access. And I would like to add that we do are, we are using some experimental drugs on severely and critically ill patients. We don't know 100% how much they're gonna work but there are some uh, medicines that have been used in China and, <clears throat> and we are using them as well. Um, and we are hoping that they will work. Most of them have anti-inflammatory effects. Some of them have antiviral uh, medications that we have used for other viral infections. So we are all being, uh, you know, trying those. And I think with time, we're gonna have more information if how effective these drugs are. So let me follow up on that, Dr. Farhan, if you don't mind. And number one is, what is that timeline actually looking like? Is there an expected timeline? And number two, is this disease completely curable? In other words, if I get infected, you know, does that mean I can only experience this illness once and I won't get it again? Or is there a possible relapse, for example? Uh, very good questions. So first, the timeline is we don't know. I think they are working on making vaccines. Same thing, they are working, but the only way we're gonna know, know, we're gonna know is by trying out these medications. And I think it's the matter of time. Time will tell how effective these are. And uh, I can tell you that I saw some positive response in two of my patients that we started them on oral therapy. 
uh, of one medicine and I see an improvement. I don't know if it was just the natural course of the illness or maybe it was the medicine, but I think with time, with everybody's experience, we will have a better idea about how effective these drugs are. Um, in terms of uh, the, um, I'm sorry, what was the other question you asked? It was, it was in regards to the timeline, which you had answered, yeah. we just don't know. So there are experimental medicines that you're trying to see. And, you right. know, I always hear with experimental medicines that it takes time to get things approved by the government. Is that the case here as well? Could that possibly delay even if there is a cure? Uh, it is going to be right now. They're very, I think we are getting some investigational drugs on compassion use from uh, the pharmaceutical companies directly. So I think uh, it's, I think right now they're going to try to do whatever the best they can. And I guess in future, they're going to have to figure out with time how, uh, you know, they get FDA approval and all that. And I think the other question you had was like relapse. Uh, right yeah. now, we don't know. I think we they are trying to develop some blood tests to see if the patients who are getting the infection are getting the immunity and if they're developing antibody, but I don't think right now there is any test to check that. So right now, I think we are still haven't reached the peak. We haven't reached a point where we are seeing relapses, uh, but we are definitely seeing patients who start to improve and then they get worse. So those are the patients we are trying to keep them in the hospital. And like Dr. Salim and Dr. Ajaz mentioned that if anybody has any symptoms of respiratory distress, any type, if they feel that they are having trouble breathing, they should go to the hospital emergency room. Don't waste your time going to urgent care and doctor's offices and just go straight to the hospital. But if you are if you have a mild illness, which most of the population is gonna have and is having, it's better to stay home and reserve the resources that we have very in a very limited amount for people who are really sick. Okay, well, let's talk about those resources. And, and I should add that um, Dr. Ajaz had mentioned free testing and a phone number, which we're definitely going to post for everyone so that if they do feel the need that they need to be tested or they need to contact their state department um, of medicine, they, they'll definitely be able to have that information. We'll make sure to get that and post it online for public viewing. But in regards to resources, we've spoken a bit about ventilators and I know there was news this week about potentially not having enough ventilators. We've spoken about beds in hospitals and potentially being you know, swarmed and not having enough beds in hospitals. But how about doctors themselves, physicians, right? I mean, we opened up this talk with you know, uh, over 50,000 Muslim physicians alone and you know, the, the percentage that are serving New York City, for example. But um, maybe one of you can comment, maybe Dr. Um, Salim, if you can tell me, do you feel as if there are enough doctors actually to, to be able to cope with this? Uh, how are your days and how are you coping in your practices and in the hospitals? It's a very good question, you know, again, um, uh, you know, I'll answer that question, but I'll talk about a couple of things, you know, which my other panelists have uh, mentioned about that. One thing was about testing, you know, I think we've been doing a lot of testing, a lot of people been getting tested which I don't think personally they may need to be tested because if they have, as we said, mild symptoms or so, they will come over it. You know, it's just going to add to their anxieties because they have some, uh, if they have the symptoms, they should self-quarantine rather than getting uh, tested with mild symptoms. So that's one thing. The second thing was um, uh, about patients, um, you know, getting to the hospitals, you know, so... Um, and then, you know, uh, the, the availability of physicians. So we've been really bombarded with the patients, you know. A lot of people who do come to emergency room don't really come to emergency room. But as a physician, you know, when they come into the emergency room, you got to see them. You have to evaluate them. So it takes a lot of resources and those things. So I think unnecessary visits to the emergency room uh, has been avoided and have been avoided by education the masses you know people need to understand you know this is a viral illness with majority of patients you know do overcome so that you know we can avoid these visits to uh, an unnecessary cause even to the physicians so that's one thing is going to be very important 
Uh, as far as you know, we are concerned, we are, you know, very um, much energetic and, you know, love to work with the patients and, you know, try to help them when they really need the help. Um, so, you know, in our hospital, I can talk about that, you know, we have right now about 72 patients who are COVID positive. In general, in NYP system, I can talk about, you know, about 20% of the patients among those who are admitted, they have been in the ICU. So, so that number is if it's somebody who come in a hospital, it doesn't mean that the 20% of the total COVID patients are gonna be in the hospitalization. It's only less than 5% of the patients of total population of who is COVID positive will be intensive care units. Uh, so we do have a shift work available now, you know, we're doing a 12 hour shift for our physicians, you know, uh, working in intensive care units along with other uh, colleagues. Uh, right now the situation is okay. I don't know the way it is spreading and the way it is being uh, tested, how it is gonna be in next days or weeks. Uh, but at this point of time, you know, we are okay with that. The other thing is, you know, not only having the ventilators or the other capabilities, the other important thing is personal uh, protective equipment, you know, which all healthcare workers, you know, need to have it, you know, which is gown gloves and the mask, proper mask, you know, depending upon where the patient is, uh, that has to be available. So right now we do have it, but there is uh, gonna be a deficiency or a lack of these equipment, you know, if this continues like that. So Dr. Yujaz, you know, I mean, Dr. Salim pointed out to how many people don't need to be in, in the emergency room that potentially that's actually a hot spot to contract the disease if you don't have it. Um, so, you know, you, and besides your practice, you also have urgent care centers. And I know that you've been bombarded as well. Um, number one, can anyone be tested simply by requesting it? Or would you prefer to sort of say, you know, I think you have symptoms that that potentially may be the virus and let's try to allocate resources where needed that way and let the doctors make the call. And number two, you know, you've been working nonstop, especially in the urgent care centers, which I'm guessing you're seeing the same problem as the hospitals as well. Do you care to comment on what you're seeing? Uh, the patients who come with the respiratory symptoms, now the guidelines we are, we are trying to uh, taper a little bit and maneuver things, that if patients, you feel that they have symptoms of a respiratory infection and they don't have exposure or they don't have anybody if they were in touch or in contact with somebody COVID positive, we are giving them antibiotic, empiric antibiotic. So that's the policy in our hospital and a lot of other hospitals are trying to do that. So we try to treat them with empiric antibiotic and give them inhaler if there is a mild respiratory symptoms and send them home. But if there is suspicion or there is a lot of travel in subway or crowded places, then we test them. So after testing them, we put them in a quarantine the situation where they tell us every day how they're feeling. If they are stable, symptoms are fine. They either take empiric antibiotic or just take Tylenol and stay home. But as, as soon as their respiratory distress, if it's getting worse, my, my personal experience so far is that most of the patients who we told them to stay home, they are doing fine. Next day, third day, fourth day, their symptoms are gradually getting better. The only issue is like one man said that he's now he was positive, now his girlfriend is positive. But both of them are uh, uh, in quarantine and they are both doing good, just taking Tylenol, no antibiotic, nothing else, drinking a lot of water, taking vitamin C to build up your immunity and just staying home. But on the other hand, people who had some respiratory issues, history in the past, they got a lot of wheezing and severe breathing issue, they had to go to hospital. In the hospital, they got IV steroids and other things and they did without ventilator, they were doing fine. As Dr. Salim said, there are only 5% of the people 20% of the people are in the hospital right now, they have it. But out of those, 5% uh, need ICU or ventilator. But keep in mind, even on the ventilator, we don't have many medications to treat. So we are get, just giving a supportive treatment, supportive measures. There are a couple of medications, uh, chlorohydroxychloroquine, we are using on one patient who actually had infected, uh, my, uh, in, infected by the uh, virus and develop cardiomyopathy, which is congestive heart failure, myocarditis. 
So we are very restricted to that medication to very uh, few patients who really need it who are in advanced situation. But that also that patient is doing better. So overall, the patients are doing better either with quarantine or in isolation in hospital. Most of them are doing better unless you know, they have very bad, um, severe underlying condition, they are deteriorating fast. But other than that, everybody is fine. Dr. Jess, let me just touch on one thing that you know you and I had touched upon before, and it goes back to this idea of resources, which you were also saying that some resources are limited to people who really need it. But um, you floated this idea of potentially having those that are in residency to sort of supplement the, the the idea to, to supplement the number of physicians that are available right now to the masses. Could you just, you know, talk to us a little bit about that and what you're seeing and whether that's feasible or possible? Is it being done anywhere? So as the cases are growing every day right now, it's, two days ago, it was 5,000 cases. Today is 15,000 cases in America. So as the cases are going more and more, the doctors are saying we were dealing with the issues what we already had in community, the illnesses. So this is additional cases. So there is a big shortage of physicians, shortage of nurses, doctors, nurse practitioners. So what Italy has done it in the final year of the medical doctors, they said that you don't need to go for the final exam. So just go ahead and uh, you, know, you are a doctor and start treating patients. So one, one of the suggestion which has been floated among the doctors community here there are many doctors who are trained in different countries, international medical graduates, and they are looking for residencies and they cannot get into the system because there, is, there has been so much competition. For one uh, hospital, for example, there are uh, 20 residency positions, there are 5,000 applicants. Yeah. So those 5,000 or 3,000 applicants, they are very qualified doctors. They have passed their USMLEs and they, they could be ready to serve if they some kind of guidelines by FDA or CDC that can be put together and those doctors who are waiting for residency and they can be trained maybe in a week or a few days and they can be put in the system under control setting, I think that could be big resource. There are many of those doctors and they will be very happy to serve. So I think there should be, uh, there, there, there is instead of, you know, going around and looking for the doctors who, who uh, who are already very, very busy. So why don't we get those residency waiting doctors, residency and training waiting, mm -hmm. so get them in the system and tell them to help us, help doctors, help nurses, help nurse practitioners, go to urgent cares, go to emergency rooms, and they will be very good, uh, you know, uh, asset for, uh, for this time. Well, thank you. That's really an interesting idea. And I want to go to Dr. Farhana. Uh, Dr. Farhana, you know, we keep talking about doctors being the front line, but I also want to ask you, you know, I, I'm assuming that amongst the vulnerable population, and we always talk about the elderly, we talk about those with underlying conditions, well, well, doctors are very much exposed to this illness as well. So I'm wondering, you know, how do you feel and how do your colleagues feel with regards to the number of protections that you have? Are you seeing physicians that are coming down with this? And what does that mean for the overall care of the population? Yeah, before I answer that question, I would like to add what Dr. Ijaz mentioned. What we have noticed, I'm sure other hospitals must be doing that too, that they're mobilizing a lot of physicians who have been in outpatient settings, uh, who are hospital employed. And since their outpatient practice is kind of very slow, so they are mo all moved into inpatient work and they are being used for all that, not only just physicians, nurse practitioners and physician assistants as well. So that's, I think that's the other thing that hospitals are doing so that we have enough of healthcare professionals. Uh, back to your question about the healthcare professionals being exposed. Yeah, definitely. We are obviously um, are very high risk also because we are exposed. And, um, and a lot of time you find out after you were exposed because sometimes patient doesn't present with all the symptoms. And then later on, you find out that you were exposed and the patient was positive. Um, but and there was, I think there was a death in Washington state as well of a physician. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what I think is important is I think they're giving us constant education and obviously proper use of PPE. 
uh, the protective equipments, personal protective equipment equipments, so that we can protect ourselves. And um, we are also supposed to wash our hands using alcohol gel as much as we can to protect ourselves and uh, maintain proper, um, you know, all the guidelines that we are telling people to do is, you know, just not hand washing, uh, you know. Um, when I go home, I don't go to go home to my kids. I take a shower, I wash myself. You know, I leave all my, you know, nobody's allowed to sit in my car. I keep the things, you know, all my bag and stuff in my car. I don't bring it inside. So we are all trying to be protective so that we can not only protect ourselves and our families because our families are also, you know, at a higher risk compared to other population. So, and moving forward, I mean, things, the way things are going, the hospitals are filling up. I think it's gonna be an issue. Uh, so I think for us, it's very important that we all practice hand hygiene and all the uh, protective measures so we can protect ourselves and protect others. And um, uh, the things, the way things are going in, you know, in Italy, it's very scary. And I hope we don't get to that stage. Um, <laughs> especially in New York State, we have a really rapidly rising number of uh, cases. So I think uh, we just have to be careful and, uh, and hope that we will be uh, protected, inshallah. Just a quick follow-up question before I go back to uh, Dr. Salim, and that is, since you are often exposed to people with various illnesses, including COVID-19, how often do doctors have the ability to test themselves? Is that something that is well, routine? Well, uh, the recommend... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the recommendation is we uh, don't, we are not getting tested. If a healthcare professional gets sick, uh, what uh, the advisory is, uh, is that you don't need to be tested because the testing is not going to change anything. If you develop a fever and our cutoff for our fever is 100, you check your temperature every day. If you develop a fever or any other symptoms of COVID, um, you should stay home. You should isolate yourself, you stay home. You have to be fever free for about for 72 hours or you have to stay home for at least seven days minimum and fever free for 72 hours before you return to work. Um, and obviously if you get sick, then you have to go to the hospital. Sick enough that you need uh, you know, care, then you need to go to the hospital. But uh, at this point, they're really discouraging testing because it's not gonna change anything. What we are like saying is if you have a COVID-like illness, like if you have symptoms, even if you don't have COVID, but you have flu or something, but if you have the same symptoms um, like COVID, it's called COVID-like illness. You just have to take care of yourself and you know stay away from work, stay home and isolate yourself. Well, Dr. Salim, you know, we've been talking so much about the physical aspects of this ailment and this illness, but you know, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of panic throughout society. I know that, you know, starting today, um, we are really supposed to only allow those essential workers to, to be able to go from place to place and, and to work. And the rest of us are really supposed to help to contain this disease by staying at home. But, you know, besides the physical ailments that people feel, how about mental impact, right? I mean, I think there's, there's just so much anxiety and worry that there has to be issues that we should be watching out for with our children, with our families, with ourselves, as far as the mental impact. Would you be able to comment a little bit about that? Sure. Very important aspect of the management, you know, which we, you asked me to touch upon. Uh, I'll try my best. Uh, so, you know, there is definitely an anxiety. If anybody gets sick or has a problem in general, too, you know, there's going to be an anxiety and worrisome about that, you know. And I will use the word, there's a word called normal, you know, N-O-R-M-A-L. Anxiety is normal, you know. The, when the anxiety becomes a panic, you know, your thinking process and things, you know, would really go wrong. And that's the situation is going to happen, you know, when people are, some people are doing it, you know, they're getting panicking, oh, what will happen? As I will go back to the same thing again and again, you know, we need to understand the, the, 
the disease process, you know, majority are no symptoms. So that's very important. And that number is about 80, 81%, which is actually, um, you know, a higher number of normal symptoms are mild symptoms than influenza. Influenza, if you do get, you know, a lot of people do get, and they have very severe symptoms, right? So in this, the symptoms are, are very mild symptoms. So, you know, we have to understand there's going to be an anxiety, but we have to take it normal. So that's one important thing, you know, and the second thing is we do need to understand, you know, this is not a disease like a diabetes or hypertension. Once you get it, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. So this is not a chronic illness. You know, this is a viral illness and this is a pandemic. We just have to live through it. So we have to understand the disease process, you know, so education of the masses is very important as we're doing right now to have people understand, you know, this is a normal process, you know, although this is a pandemic, but anxiety is a process of this, you know, so we have to understand that. And then once we think this is an anxiety, this is not a panic situation, we will sit down, relax, and we'll think, you know, what we need to do, which the, you know, the, the steps we talk about that, you know, if you don't have much of the fever, much of the symptoms, you stay home, you take some Tylenol, and drink plenty of fluids, you know, self-isolate yourself, take care of yourself and stay away from your family, you know, to make sure uh, it is about a week process or so, you know, and you will get through it. So got it. So mainly the message is equip yourself with the knowledge, learn how to play your part in this role. And, and hopefully, although some anxiety is normal, you know, equip yourself with, with the knowledge and hopefully that anxiety and that stress level will decrease. So, you know, um, I would love to continue this conversation, but I know each of you are super busy and a lot of you are actually just waiting for this interview to end so you can go back into helping people on the front lines. And, you know, I want to thank you all for your time, but I'd also like to end with just giving each of you the opportunity to talk a little bit about how you think that your Muslim identity in particular you know, helps you to serve the community in this capacity, if there's a special role for Muslim doctors to play and, and how your own Islamic identity helps to serve the community, even if it means putting yourself and your families potentially at higher risk. So let's start, I guess, with you, Dr. Shazad, since you're on right now, and, and we'll touch with each of the other physicians as well. Sure. Um, the message I would have it, you know, if you uh, know, reading from the Quran, you know, Surah Bakra. I believe it's item number 153, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوِ وَنَقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالْسَمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ سَعَبِرِينَ So, you know, the God has said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he's going to test us with khawf, with the fear. So is this is a right fear? Yes, absolutely. You know, this is a fear right now. So who is going to be with them? Who's going to be sabirin? You know, who's going to be patient? So again, this is anxiety, a fear, a normal, if we stay this, we're going to be in Sabarin and Allah is going to be with us. Uh, that's important aspect. And the second take home message, which I would do uh, to all my listeners um, to is hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. That's the most important thing I would do to myself and also my family and to all everybody who's listening. Thank you so much. Dr. Ijaz Ahmed, how about you? What's your reply to this question? What can you add? So um, the way we are raised uh, to become doctor in Muslim family, this is how we are raised to, to help others. We have been doing all our life, regardless the time, day, weekends, seven days a week at night. So uh, I think this is just an, another extra duty. And uh, we can't just stay home. A lot of people are telling me and others, doctors, just stay home and don't put yourself at risk. But I think this is a time where, as a Muslims, as a doctor, as humans, we really have to be on the front lines. And I, I just don't feel that I can be home. I am on the uh, front line every day seeing patients and trying to help until we get infected or we get, <laughs> we get uh, exposure. So some of my friends actually, they, they got uh, exposure, they started ha having headache, fever, they have quarantined them, themselves at home for 72 hours. So hopefully that does not happen, but until that happens, we will continue going to hospitals, going to urgent cares, going to offices, continue to do the what is our duty. Thank you so much. And Dr. Farhana Sati, I think, you know, 
you have the last word here. Any pertinent information you want to share as well as your perspective on how your faith helps you to, to add to the, uh, the absolute critical resource of your services as a physician? Yeah, definitely, Afaf. I think uh, we all know that we have, because of our faith, I think it really helps us in every single aspect of our life, and especially in this situation of crisis. We all believe that this is a test from Allah and it will pass, but we have to make sure that we do our job so that we can be recognized in, the, in, uh, in front of Allah when the time comes. So I think this is uh, the faith and the belief that this is a test. It helps us keep on going. And obviously, if Allah Ta'ala has given, I feel like given me and all of us the capability to help people in any way possible. So I feel very privileged at this point that Allah Ta'ala has given me this uh, privilege and, um, and I should be doing my job as I, you know, in any aspect, and especially at this point when they really need us. And I think we all are trying our best to do what we can. And inshallah, uh, we will be rewarded by Allah Ta'ala. And that uh, really helps us. Well, I'm, I pray that you are all rewarded for doing the work that you do. I thank you so much for your time. And in order for all of us to um, really reap your services, we invite all three of you to share your contact information, if you'd like, with regards to other resources as well. Please forward them to Care New York or to myself personally. We'll make sure that that gets posted. And may God, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of you safe. Um, we thank you again, not just for your time, but the time and, 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 uh, and services that you're providing to the community, the broader community, the Muslim community, and for being there for all of us during this pandemic. Um, and we appreciate truly and sincerely the self-sacrifice of all of you and your colleagues. And thank you so much. For all of your um, for all of your efforts, and thank you to all of those that are listening. Thank you to all those that have also posted comments. Please share this video. We'll also be sharing the link for a later viewing. So please help us to spread this information so that we're all doing our part in our role to remain calm, to self-contain, and to slow down this pandemic, and to be a part of the solution. We thank you again. From Care New York to all of you. Jazakum Allah khair. Salam alaikum to all of you. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Thank you.